Well, hey, my name is Ryan Earnhardt from creativesoundlab.tv, where audio recording is an art form. Well, today is part two of the Mixing Drums Without Samples. It's a multi-video series about mixing drums, doing it without samples, and doing it in context of a song. I've recorded drum tracks specifically for this series uh, to a song that I've actually already recorded. I just re-recorded the drums so that it's just from scratch using the exact methods that I used in the mastering the art of recording drums without samples. That's a whole new, uh, whole other series. If you haven't caught that yet, go ahead and check that out first. And that's going to basically keep you up to date on what we have with the drum tracks for this series. I use those exact same techniques for the drums that we're going to be mixing in this series. Now, like I said last week, uh, I, I didn't make this video about EQ. That'll be the next video. And it's important to note that even though I'm doing compression this week, EQ next week, is that the two actually don't have to go in that order when we stack our effects. Uh, a lot of times EQs can come before compressors, but I think that for making decisions on how to set those compressors properly, and even to make the decisions of if you even need EQ, we really should just pull up our tracks and then add compression. And just see what's there, see what the compressors can do, get all of our levels playing nice, and really make judgments that way. Compressors can add some flavor, but they really aren't, we're not really tweaking the tone of the tracks quite yet. Uh, we'll get to that next episode, but really we're just controlling the dynamics of the track, the, the attack, the sustain, and really the, the, uh, the overall dynamics, loudness of those tracks. So in addition to the PDF for today's episode, I'm actually gonna be giving you the raw tracks. Now these are the same raw tracks uh, used uh, here at the studio. For the entire series, we're using these raw tracks. And I would really love to uh, hear what you do with these drum tracks and uh, really let you experience for yourself firsthand on your own recording system of the processes and the various techniques that I'm teaching. Here's what we're gonna be covering today on compression. First, we're gonna be asking, what are the goals of our compression? What are we actually looking to do with adding compression? Next, we're gonna be talking about what to listen for when we add compression. Specifically, I wanna give you concrete examples of, okay, here's what's happening when we add the compression, here's what I'm going for, and really here's what it sounds like along the way. Third, I'm gonna be giving you some techniques on grouping compression and parallel compressing. So this is a great technique on drums to thicken and fat your drum tracks. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, when we talk about the goals for our compression and use of compression, a lot of times I'm really thinking about how I wanna be shaping the different uh, t tones and sounds of the drum. So let's just take a, uh, uh, let's say a wave from a snare drum. And uh, this is maybe uh, a, the two and four backbeat of this like awesome funky groove that the drummer laid down for us. And uh, really, we want to uh, we want to get it even tighter, right? We want to add even more attack. Maybe this particular snare drum had a lot of different sustain to it, and we decided that later we want to actually just kind of tighten it up a little bit. Uh, we didn't add muffling because you know muffling changes really the attack of the drum as well. It really changes a lot about the drum. Uh, with a lot of adverse side effects. But compression is a great way to really tighten things up in a very musical way. And so uh, what we can do is use compression to reduce certain parts of the wave and leave other parts of the wave alone. Compression is all about reducing. And we can talk about what ratio and attack time and all these different things uh, really do. I can demonstrate those for you at the mixing desk, but I really just want to kind of graphically show you what's happening to these waves as we're adding compression. Of course, everything is in terms of reduction. So if we wanted to add attack to this snare drum, then really what we can do is we can turn down the sustain portion of that particular note. So if we were to set a compressor to let's say this is the volume uh, representation of the compressor, and it's going to sense that the wave has arrived, and we're gonna tell it to wait for a portion of time. Okay, we'll have to set this by ear and just listen, but we'll tell it to wait. It's called a slow attack. Okay, so it'll, it'll hear the wave, we're gonna tell it to wait, and then reduce. And then it's gonna actually turn down the portion of this part of the wave here, the sustain part. And then 
we're going to tell it to very nicely and gently raise back up again. That's called the release. So we're actually communicating through the attack and the re release times of the compressor of where we want the wave to be reduced. Now, the end result is that the wave has more um, attack and less uh, sustain. So it has the effect of basically sounding tighter. And so we can add makeup gain if we need to. You know, this is all just a, a relative thing of if you take away some, you can add it later. But really what we're doing is tightening this wave up. Now, a lot of times drums, uh, I'm not adding so much attack with compression, at least for me in, in, in my mixing. Uh, usually what I'm doing is I'm looking to add sustain because um, I have you know a really killer drum sound. I want to preserve that. I want to make it really poke through and translate into a final mix that's very, very dense. So what I have to do is use a little bit different method and actually cut down on this attack. That way I'm getting more subtleties, more of the harmonic content that's ringing out in the drum in the sustain portion. So what I'm doing is I'm actually setting a, a pretty quick attack time. So the compressor senses this very first transient here and it pretty much reduces it as quick as it can and then it very quickly rises back up. So it's really trying to just only reduce this area right in here. And then what I'm doing also is I can basically raise this entire area up because now that I've reduced this transient, now I can basically make the whole thing louder. And so it basically, in effect, it reduces this so that I can raise this portion up. And really that's adding sustain. I, I, use, this for, uh, I use this for snare a lot. I use it for a kick. Uh, I use it for toms nearly every single time I mix. I'm always adding a little bit of sustain and just look for music in the meters to make sure that uh, this release is kind of coming up um, with the sustain of this wave. So let's check it out uh, at the mixing desk and really just show you how some of these concepts actually sound um, while we're mixing our drums. Okay, so I have some really cool things to show you. And before we dig into applying compression, let's just have a quick listen to refresh our memory on what these tracks are actually sounding like. Uh, this is really just nothing on the tracks so far. Um, this is just microphone to preamp to converter. So uh, nothing in between the mic and the converter. Let's see what the raw tracks sound like. Okay, so that's really the gist of the song, and uh, the uh, the main tracks of the song, such as vocal, um, the guitar, the bass, uh, that actually does have some compression on at this point. Um, I went ahead and added those so that we can really start to um, really hear everything in context properly. So let's check out uh, let's check out the overheads first. And what I've done is actually put both of the overhead uh, channels into uh, this microphone, I'm sorry, this uh, track here. So this way I can basically uh, compress both channels of the overhead at the same time um, in a true stereo compressor. Let's have a listen to those overheads. Okay, not bad. Now I can pull up the kick. Ah, very interesting. So right off the bat, uh, going back to the phasing and polarity um, episode of um, Mastering the Art of Recording Drums, I talked about the uh, polarity uh, flipping here. So 
Um, really what happens is, is, is waves are slightly out of phase by a matter of several degrees, maybe 20, 30, 40. Um, the closer they are to 180 degrees, the more cancellation you have. And um, it's not an exact um, fix, but sometimes flipping the whole polarity, um, which is basically instead of the waves going up, they go down instead. And a lot of times you can hear a difference. I thought I actually had uh, avoided this issue, but I guess it sounds a little better flipped. So uh, here it is again. Wow, that's crazy how I missed that. Uh, now, I wonder it sounded thin in, <laughs> in last week's video. Um, so that fixed that. And as I go through, it's just good to be checking these things. And so... What I'd like to do is go ahead and start adding some compression. And um, usually the overheads are pretty crazy. Um, that would be this track here. And I'll go ahead and start adding uh, some compression here. Let's see here, I thought I had a compressor pulled up. I'll go ahead and uh, pull another one up here. And I usually like this one. Uh, this is the 33609, just the UAD plugin. And um, I'm just looking to add some sustain to the cymbals and help tame that snare drum. Just to try to make it sound like it's somewhat glued together. Uh, let's have a listen to just, um, just the overhead here. So very quickly, uh, this compressor is a little bit different. It's not the one that I really want to show you the concepts of compression on, but this is what I use. So just to stay true to my, my methods that I usually like to do, um, this is what I use. Um, and really what I'm doing, there's no attack time, but there is a release time. So I can set it to uh, basically release very quickly. So the reduction ends earlier. Therefore, when I add makeup gain, to compensate for the amount being reduced, it sounds like there's more sustain. Okay, just like on the window that I just finished uh, drawing for you, this is what's happening with this compressor. Uh, this is a, a one and a half to one uh, ratio. Uh, we can get to that in a moment. But really, uh, this is what's happening here. I'm lowering the point, the threshold, of which the compression kicks in. It's being reduced quickly, right away, at a set, uh, at a set speed, but I can change the uh, recovery so that it gets out of the way for that sustain ringing out in the room, the room sound, or the cymbals. And then I'm basically, everything's relative. So I turn the attack down, and this is allowing, it's not reducing the um, sustain at all. And in fact, I'm actually adding some. And so the whole wave appears, sorry, the whole sound appears to gain some uh, uh, some sustain. So here it is again. Here's here's it off. Now this is a great time to mention how to how to really listen to uh, compression, and uh, we're also going to cover what to listen for as well, and um, just how to match things up and and all that. Really, the first thing I do when I'm really getting used to a compressor and what it's doing is I crank it. I absolutely crank it. So um, this here is is pretty mild, uh, but let's really crank it and see what it can do. So, you know, we really can hear what the compressor is doing and how quickly it's working. Um, I increased the ratio, which is the amount um, per, uh, per input. Um, it reduces at a 6 to 1 ratio on the output. So, and then I also lowered the threshold so more of the wave is being affected. Um, this is a great way to experiment with like the timing of the wave. So this is very fast. And with this setting, I can really hear what it sounds like when I mess with the timing. So here we can actually hear that by slowing down the release, I'm actually not able to finish the reduction by the next note. Therefore, 
the attack of the next note is actually being caught up in that reduction. It's not getting out of the way in time. And so, like I've been saying, music in the meters, if you don't see the music, the groove in the meters, then chances are your uh, reduction could be too slow on the release. So speed it up. So it's just about to come to zero before the next beat. And, and that's really how I time my compressors. Let me finish setting this compressor. Um, it's really not the best one to start out on, but this is really where I do start though, is, is in the overheads, I do a mild compression. And another way you can be listening for compression and how to listen to this is by turning the volume down. So this uh, is more milder and less uh, obvious than really cranking it. But when you do turn the volume down, you're able to hear what it's doing uh, really from a bird's eye view. Let me demonstrate that real quick. Here's uh, just regular volume here. Off. On. Now I'll turn the volume down, same thing. Off. On. So you can really hear just by turning down the volume or by cranking it what the compressor is doing. And this is just a way to help you um, get comfortable with any compressor that you may have in your DAW and really how to set it correctly. Other thing I should mention about setting compressors correctly is that if you see you have a 4 dB reduction, then you should probably boost 4 dB. That way when you're cutting it on and off, you don't have this massive jump in volume. Um, I have mentioned before in my videos about um, adding gain when you add compression. Uh, so if you um, have very low signals, this is an opportunity to actually give it a little more juice. But if you're comparing back and forth, you should really always compare at um, you know the same perceived volume between the on and off uh, positions. So this is kind of my overhead starting point for compression, just to add some sustain to that symbol and tame the snare. Then from here, what I do is I go to um, to the kick. And the kick, I'm really just looking to fatten it up and make it more consistent. Okay, so that's pretty much a starting point for me. Let me explain what's going on here. Uh, we have the attack and we have the release. Just like on the window diagram, um, this is really where it comes into play. Now, uh, for this compressor, the, 11, the 1176 style, you basically ram up the volume until it hits this threshold. I, I kind of picture it kind of between these two knobs here. So you're ramming in, ramming in the, uh, the volume into the threshold. Um, the other compressors, you actually lower that threshold down. Uh, this one is a fixed threshold, so you have to boost before to achieve um, reaching that threshold. And then you kind of lower this one. So as you raise this one, you lower the output. And so this is just keeping things under control. Um, like I said, if you need to add volume anyhow for some reason, you can always just kind of keep this output kind of high but it's turning this one up and then turning this one down. If you turn this one down, then you turn this one up. This keeps your volumes relatively the same. And um, then the attack. So this is very quick attack, uh, and this is slightly slower attack, um, but it is very fast. Uh, and then this is a very quick release for adding sustain. This is a very kind of slow, I think it's about 
one and a half seconds over here. And then this is probably a shade under a second over here, I think. Uh, I may be wrong in that, but that's okay. Uh, really, this is just more about how to set it and listen to compressors. And you can be research researching the tech specs if you really want to get into this stuff. Uh, it's all available online. So um, so this is really how to control the, sh the uh, sustain and tone, not tone shaping, but really the attack and the sustain of the of the different notes and we're ramming into the threshold but then lowering it okay it's a fixed threshold so in order to have the compressor do anything we have to add volume now the ratio is kind of like a graph so um, you have kind of a diagonal line and uh, something going in at say uh, negative 10 from unity um, maybe only comes out say you know, maybe half that volume because it's a little too loud. So uh, now four to one, you know, it's basically um, just increasing as we go up. Now starting up here, it's really kind of a limiter. Um, there's really not uh, a ton of difference mathematically when you get into the kind of li the limiting range. Um, but really, what does this all mean? It really doesn't mean a whole lot. You really just, just need to know that the four means more gentler, uh, compression, and you can compress more soft and loud sounds. At a higher ratio, then you're really just compressing the most loud sounds of that signal. Maybe just the loudest of the whole thing. So if it's a, a drum set, then it'd be maybe the kick or the snare that kind of pokes out as the loudest. And usually it's the low end kind of content as well. Uh, this was not by any means a full ex uh, explanation. But that kind of gets you uh, part of the way to really know how to how to navigate some of this stuff. So let's really uh, play around with with how I can actually be shaping this note. Now, for whatever reason, on this compressor, I, I just really like the low end in kind of the 12 or the 20 ratio and kind of pushing it hard into about negative 7, negative 10. And I know that there's some mixers that that's not hard compression at all. Um, but I know for me, that's that's pretty good. And um, I'm really kind of adding some sustain just a touch. And I have a slow attack to try to let that um, that slap of the beater of, of the kick drum um, get through. That's kind of my goal for this. Let me show you what a couple different settings sound like. So this setting here is, is really pushing it to the extreme here. It's basically um, only reducing for a very quick amount and immediately getting out of the way. The release is very quick, so then the rest of the sustain is untouched. Of course, everything's being boosted, so that's why we have a perceived increase of the sustain. And the attack is being reduced, allowing us to actually raise up the volume a substantial amount because... Um, we don't have that initial transient that's so much louder than the rest of the sustain of the drum. So what I'm doing here is just kind of feathering the sustained kind of the mud out of that sound. So uh, let me crank it to give you kind of a more extreme um, and obvious example. There's kind of a lot of mud, a lot of kind of dribbling with the beater. Multiple hits after the main hit there that I don't want to be heard. And 
and there it goes away. So I'm kind of just feathering this to kind of cut things out that I don't want um, so that everything isn't, you know, being, um, you know, amplified. So uh, really, I'm just kind of feathering it to get the sound that I want. Okay, so this has all been soloed. Let's hear what it sounds like in the rest of the mix. Okay, that's really consistent, and that's what I want. So there you go. Um, let's move on to uh, the snare and snare bottom. And this is not going to be as detailed, uh, you know. Um, I need to keep it <laughs> a reasonable length for these videos. But uh, really, it's the same kind of deal. You know, I'm just uh, feathering uh, the different uh, attack and release times and really just trying to shape the notes. what I'm doing is same thing I'm teaching you guys I'm kind of riding it a little hard and getting a little bit more aggressive um, results to kind of find my settings and then I'm just kind of lowering it down a little bit So literally, I'm just doing negative one and negative two here. It's real subtle. I've used more aggressive settings to find the sound, and then I dial way back down because by the time we get through with everything, we don't want to really kill all the life out of the drums here. I'll do the same thing with, uh, with the bottom. Okay, so now I'm just going to dial that down so it's not too extreme. So you can hear the dynamics really picking up um, as I hit the drum harder. You know, obviously it kicks in, but really nothing more than about negative three. Okay, let's see how this sounds um, in the mix. So I realized I didn't have enough volume coming out of um, kind of the output of the compressor. I don't want to really, you know, ram the fader because I like to keep it in kind of the sweet spot where I can make the most um, sensitive adjustments. So you can just come back here and push some more on the output. So that's sounding really good already. Basically, kick and snare is where it's at. If you have that, you're pretty well under control. 
obviously we have overheads, kick and snare. Um, that's really where the groove's at. And you can hear how much of a difference this already made. Um, let me turn off the compression just so you can see um, the work that we've done and uh, really the difference in the sound. Here is uh, with the compression. And here is without the compression. So it's just a little bit more under control and focused. And that snare definitely is fatter um, because of the compression. Okay, so before moving on, I'm actually going to um, just apply these effects as a new take. Um, you can also play, if you run out of uh, processing power with your plugins, uh, I've actually recorded tracks into a new one. And I know Ableton Live uh, even has like a render and flatten feature. So it's called something like that where you flatten it and it gets rid of the, uh, the labor intensive uh, plugins. So I'm going to go ahead and render some of these out uh, so I can free up some of uh, my processing power and I'll be right back. Okay, so the processing is finished. I'm going to go ahead and I have this new take selected with the effects applied. Then I'm just going to go ahead and turn off the effects so I don't apply them twice. So this is the, uh, basically, what we're hearing is the same thing that you we just created, but I don't have to use the effects. So now I can move on to my uh, tom and the floor tom of this superphonic take. Now, I will be uh, giving out... Um, you know, the other uh, tracks as well. But really, we're just mainly focusing on the superphonic take. Um, if you recall from video one, I did three different takes of this with three different snare drums. This is the Ludwig uh, Mid-70s Superphonic. So let's check out these toms here. Usually for toms, you know, I am uh, looking for sustain. Uh, I want them uh, fat. I want plenty of sustain uh, to work with here. Now, I do have some, you know, kind of pushed... Uh, toms here that are a little bit distorted and once it gets in the mix it, it sounds just fine but it does kind of add some compression like characteristics um, but let's uh, let's go ahead and, and go for it so let's check out these toms here yes. So, you know, they sound really good as is, um, you know, but I'm still going to add compression just to ease um, their sound and really polish them up. Um, they have been pushed a little bit. Um, I can definitely hear that, uh, but I still want to see what, what we can make of them. Uh, so let's check out this high tom here. So this is the extreme setting here. I mean, it's just crazy ring. Um, then I can turn it down a little bit. So you see we actually slowed down the release and so it's not actually getting out of the way in time for that sustain to poke through. So it's actually reducing some of that sustain and then coming up. You, we can watch the meters here. Watch for the music in the meters. And, you know, Tom's, in my, in my mind, it's pretty easy to to deal with um you just kind of um try to not screw it up too much so you just try to add some sustain that's really all that i really do okay just a little bit there 
That's nothing. That's compressed. Off. On. And if there's any doubt what we're doing, we can turn down the volume. That's with the compressor. Com compressor. This is off. This is on. So just it just that sustain lasts just a second longer with the compressor. And it may not matter now, but it could be just a thing to poke it in, uh, poke it out through a, a dense mix. Uh, we can always come back and adjust this, but that'll be my starting point for that one. And something similar for the floor tom. So kind of my thinking is, is can I bring out all that gnarly tone of that, of that drum? So let's try that. Let's see how it sounds in context. And this is usually the point where I just crank the monitors because I'm getting into it. You know, it's like, well, that sounds awesome. So, like, that sounds pretty good, you know. Um, it may be too big. Um, we can cover that in next week's episode on uh, the EQ section with our high-pass filter if, it is, if it's too big. Um, this is really getting into next week of, like, making decisions with um, kind of frequency hogs and things. Um, but I'm really digging that, and that sounds really cool. And so I'm going to go ahead and bounce. I'm going to go ahead and bounce these down uh, just like I did the kick and snare. And then we'll move on to uh, the room sound. And then um, the uh, general, the more general kind of bus and parallel compression. Okay, so I have these bounced down. They're selected, so that's the take that we're actually hearing. Go ahead and kill um, those effects so we don't apply them um, to the, the new take with those effects already on it. So we already have compression on the overhead, uh, and now we're going to the room mic. And this just gets more and more interesting. And so we have nice, full, thick, fat drums at this point. Now uh, this is more the air and the three dimension around it. And once again, going back to this compressor, this 1176 um, emulation here, and you know, eventually I will have uh, episodes on outboard 1176s and such. Uh, this is just a great way to start the teaching methods uh, just very, very quickly for you guys um, on exactly how I do it. And so for this, okay, what's the goals of adding this to the room mic? Well, probably it's going to be cut out all of the transients and just have that room. I don't want a bunch of like splatty kind of uh, sharp transients that are audible. Uh, I would rather have just all the, uh, just all the the uh, reverb basically, and none of the transients. So I'll most likely have a quick attack, quick release kind of deal, and um, probably in the next episode I'll be thinning it out and kind of shaping the room sound um, to really dial in how it's being able to poke through a dense mix, and also help support the drum sound if it's a kind of a thin drum sound. Uh, we can have a kind of a thicker room sound, for example, to kind of even out the sounds. But let's get started on this. Uh, r these two room mics, they're just an SM57. <laughs> and so uh, it's really not, um, not extravagant stuff here. But 
you know what? I, I think you guys should try this. Uh, it, you know, it really does and can work. Uh, let's check it out. So I reduce first because I know I'm just going to ram it in just a second. It's just so I don't want to blow out my speakers. And that's, and that's not bad. That's pretty noisy, but that's not bad. And we can play around with the attack and release. Another really cool thing about uh, the design and circuit of the 1176s is, is that you can um, hit multiple buttons. Uh, for the UAD at least, uh, you can actually hold shift and then push down the buttons that you'd like. Um, so if 20 is selected, you just go down to 4 with uh, holding shift and you get the whole 4 buttons. You can also do kind of a combination of buttons. Um, so, you know, only maybe the bottom 2 or top 2. Uh, kind of deal. So this is all buttons mode. One of the things the 1176 is kind of known for. So that's with compression. Here's without. Here's with compression. Here's without. Here's with. Maybe I'll try to bring out some of that snare is what I'm trying to do. I don't like that. So it's all starting to sound the same, I guess, because I have it pushed pretty hard, but... You know, with anything, including, you know, adding reverb and all this, you know, always do what you think and then back it down 20%. Uh, the good chance is that the next day you'll thank yourself for not going uh, what you originally thought was, was good. It's always good to go a little bit, you know, err on the lesser side. Okay, let's see what it sounds like in a mix. I'll start it with the room mics off. Now, I'm trying to watch my output for because I am recording a video. I have to kind of do multiple things at once here. 
Um, I usually don't ever touch this fader. In fact, I don't even have the knob. It, it fell off because uh, I don't care. I mean, I really don't ever touch it to adjust the volume. If you see me touch it, it's because I don't want it to actually clip uh, in the screen recording. Um, you know, so I don't want it to, to, to ruin the audio that you guys are hearing. That's the only reason why I'm really touching it. Usually what I can do is um, do kind of a whole thing where I select a bunch of channels. In fact, I can just do that now. Just select everything. Uh, base. There we go. So now we have everything there. Then I can just kind of turn everything down, give myself just a little bit of room to work, and then go back. Sorry, I can't really see the lights glaring to where I can't tell what's lit up and what's not. Okay, so now I have a little bit more room to work. So this room mic really does that a lot. Uh, we can really push it hard if we want to. See what that sounds like. That would definitely be on the high end of, of, of volume for that channel. Uh, I probably set it way down here. And of course, I am getting some symbols in there, adding compression, adds in, you know, kind of everything that that thing's picking up. And we'll have to kind of smooth some of this out uh, with the next episode with the EQ. And so really what we what we want to do is um, if we're happy with what we have so far, we're thinking, man, this is awesome. We are just about there. Then what I do is typically um, kind of group everything together and compress it um, as, you know, a full kind of deal. So it's compressing everything all at once. We've so far just added compressors to, you know, various, you know, tracks one at a time you know, and it treated it one at a time. And really what I like to do is just kind of add something very subtly just to kind of, uh, so a compressor is interacting to the kick and shaping the sound of the cymbals and the sustain of the cymbals every time a kick comes through. So, you know, there is there is something really cool to adding compression to the whole kind of deal. Uh, so what I've done is added a compressor. Um, we can see what that looks like right here. Back to that 33609. Let's check it out. So now it sounds pretty huge. I mean, this is sounding compressed. Even though I was doing 1 to 2 to, you know, 3 dB of reduction on the snare, it's it really goes back to that, uh, that room mic that was really compressed. And once we add compression on the drum bus, if you call it that, then uh, it's really starting to sound pretty squashed. So this is why everything's kind of a little out of time. Here's without the compression. You can see it's just it's it's there, but it's it's not a cohesive kind of deal. Here's with the compression on all the drums. So it's just it's gluing things together, and I, I really don't like that term, but it really kind of does work. Um, that term just works. Let me crank this uh, compressor so we can really hear what it's doing. Right now it's at a 3 to 1, and I was just getting, you know, a few dB. But let's crank it, see what it does. So 
So we can see that kick is really triggering it. That's the biggest thing that is triggering this. And if you like, you know, Rage Against the Machine, you always have those kicks that are causing the change in the sustain of those cymbals. It's just part of that cool effect of exactly this kind of bus compression here. So it'll take a few rounds of this to really get this and really be satisfied. So that's the bus compression. Now I want to also demonstrate the parallel compression, which is kind of a term a lot of people have been throwing around. Really all it means is that you're splitting off the signal, throwing it into another channel, kind of like a copy of what you're hearing, and you're compressing that separately and then re-adding it in. So what I've done is actually taken the kick, the snare, and the toms, and I've thrown it out to uh, the track 13 drums para comp. And so it comes over here to drums para comp on 13. And this here is a compressor that's only compressing the kick, snare, and toms. Then what this will do is this will go to the master channel, the stereo out here, along with this drum uh, kind of bus here. And so these two are in the same hierarchy level going to this master channel. Uh, this way I can push the kick and the snare and the toms without pushing all the cymbals. And this is kind of the main, uh, I guess, main, main deal that I use it for. Um, a lot of people use it as a thickener because you can really push that uh, kick and snare and really get a fat sound. It's got a unique sound. Let's check it out. So you can really, I am pushing it kind of to the extreme. I probably wouldn't have it that loud in a mix. We're basically doubling up on kick and snare at this point. We're doubling up on everything, okay? Except the cymbals. The cymbals are not doubled. Um, but we're really compressing um, kick, snare, and toms twice at this point. Um, let's try a different type of compressor. Um, I'll go through each, each three. They each kind of shape the sound in a different way. This one's definitely kind of noisy. Um, here's the compressor solid um, before it's added in um, with the rest of the drums here. Okay, here is uh, the uh, LA3A, which I love because it cuts the attack and lets uh, the sustain through. And here's an LA-2A, which for this particular plugin, it tends to add a lot of attack. So we have three different ways we can slice this. Let's try it in context and see what each of these uh, parallel compression jobs is actually doing to our sound. LA-3A. LA-2A. So it does, you know, there is some subtlety happening here. That's why we kind of have to solo it. Um, I've ahead of time gone through and really done the whole listening thing of, you know, listen softly or crank it or a little bit of both to really hear what this compressor is doing to the sound. Another thing that I did to set this is I only listened to it and then balanced uh, what's going into the compressor so that the kick doesn't completely dominate uh, this particular compressor. So let's let's say like this one here is, is a pretty aggressive one. Um, so let's just have a listen to just this compressor, what it's hearing without the drum bus, and we can just dial in the send 
um, these knobs here, just like on a send on a regular old mixer. So we can um, vary up um, the amount of snare that's going in here versus the amount of kick or toms. So this is kick at unity, just full volume of whatever this fader is here. Then what I've done is to give some balance, I've turned it down. So I've turned it down to maybe 6 or 8 dB or so. Uh, same thing with the bottoms of the snare, the top of the snare, the toms, the low tom. I've just gone through and custom tailored um, kind of the balance that's going into this compressor, then set the compressor of how I want it, and then added it back in. I add it back in, I listen, I listen uh, loudly so I can hear what it's doing and how it's interacting, and make sure it's not like too noisy. And then I take it down about 10 to 20 percent just to kind of add, um, you know, use it as a subtlety type effect. I think really for this, I like the LA2A, I like that punch, so I'm gonna um, use it for that. So, you know, I actually haven't done this in a while for this method. Um, you know, to me, it can sound really overcompressed in a hurry, but this is just one method that is pretty popularly uh, used. And it's just good to know how to do it. So let me know if you guys have any questions about some of this stuff. I know I covered a lot. And really, it all comes down to uh, what is the goal of the compression. And for me, I'm usually trying to make the drums sound more fuller. Uh, for the cymbals, I'm trying to make them sound uh, a little more uh, sustained. And um, then it's really how to listen to compressors. Turn it down or crank the compressor to see what it's doing. And then from there, um, do you need to group any of the tracks together to help them kind of glue themselves together? It's a cohesive unit. I start out by listening as a cohesive unit to the overheads just to kind of give me a uh, kind of top-down view, a bird's eye view. Um, but then I really start to fill in uh, the close mics and get things sounding fuller and fuller as I go. So next week, I already mentioned, you know, it's on EQ. And it's a really great episode because uh, there's so many crazy ideas out there of how to add EQ. And not to say that they're not legitimate, but, you know, there are some best practices that can really work nine times out of ten I'd love to show those techniques with you. It's going to be a great episode. I'll see you next week.